Hello, everyone. Uh, so as I think I mentioned on, on the Slack, uh, Martin wasn't able to make it today. He's going to do his presentation remotely. So um, we have things a little bit differently arranged AV-wise. So uh, give us a second just to make sure that we got a good audio. And uh, we will let him get started. Thanks. I'm really sorry that I can't be there in person. Um, I caught COVID, and thus I decided it was better not to mix with a large crowd of people. Um, I can't see any of you, um, but hopefully you can see me and, and hear me. And uh, it's really wonderful to get to talk today about collaborative text editing algorithm. Uh, so let's get started on that. I won't talk a lot, but rather I thought I would start off with a little video demo um, of a tool you probably know. This is Google Docs. Um, I've got two windows here side by side, and you can see I type in one window and what I show, what I type in one window shows up in the other. Now I can also uh, tell my operating system to drop all of the network traffic between these two windows, and that will then mean that stuff that I type on one side will not appear on the other, uh, because the connection is interrupted, but I can type things on both windows then tell my operating system to re-enable the network traffic, wait for a second, and you can see they've resynced back up into the same state. So I add the word world, type before the exclamation mark on the left-hand side, and a smiley face after the uh, exclamation mark on the right-hand side. And uh, those two um, edits were then merged together um, as the network connection was repaired. And so this is really the crux of what a collaborative text editor has to do. Um, so it needs to allow each user to have a copy of the document on their own local computer and for each user to modify that document without waiting for network round trip. So for example, if the red user here on, on the top types the word world before the exclamation mark, um, then those edits are immediately applied to that user's own copy of the document in their own web browser without waiting for a network round trip to the server. Because uh, if you had to wait for, for a network round trip on every single keystroke, it would be really annoying and really painful to use. And so therefore, the app has to allow this sort of optimistic update mode where you immediately update your own local copy, but that means that somebody else might be concurrently updating the document as well. So you might end up with slightly out of sync documents, and then the collaborative editing algorithm has to somehow get those documents back in sync again, back into some state where all of the edits have been uh, merged together. Now, there are lots of algorithms which allow you to do these kind of things. And in this talk, I don't really want to go back into all of the historical algorithms that have been de developed for the last 40 years or something like that. Um, I will just mention some of the new algorithms that we've been using, uh, which allow us to do some interesting things. Uh, the f uh, family of algorithms I will talk about are conflict-free replicated data types, or CRDTs. Um, there have been a bunch of talks about CRDTs at Strange Loop in the past, and so again, I'm not going to rehash all of that. Uh, I will just give you the uh, very brief summary of what these CRDTs allow you to do. And the idea is this. Let's say you have two uh, users, user A and user B. They each make some edits to their local copy of the document, and then they send each other those edits so that uh, user A receives the edits from user B, and user B receives the edits from user A. And what we want is that after the users have exchanged those edits, then their documents should be in the same state. Um, and so that is uh, that should be the case, even though they saw the edits in a different order. So user A first saw user A's own edits and then the edits from user B. User B saw those edits in the opposite order, but nevertheless, we want them all to end up in the same state. And we do this mathematically by making the operations commutative. But that by itself is not really enough. And so let me show another problem that, um, that occurs and that we need to solve with collaborative text editing. And that's to do with suggesting changes. And so, you know, Google Docs has this suggestion mode where whatever you type is not immediately an edit to the document, but rather a kind of proposed edit that somebody else can then approve uh, or decline. And so, I did this experiment here with two people working on a uh, document at the same time. One user at the top is doing a copy edit of the introduction section of this uh, text, whereas a second user below is typing a new section below. And you can see this is incredibly visually noisy, what is going on here. Um, and moreover, 
you know, it's super distracting to be seeing what the other user is doing concurrently. And then after you decide you want to review or you want to go through, you have to then click the check mark box uh, many, many times to actually individually accept all of these individual edits. And uh, hopefully what this uh, little video has shown you is just actually it's incredibly painful doing sort of complex edit work workflows with Google Docs where you want to suggest a bunch of changes but um, allow other people to review them before they get applied, uh, having different people working on different sections concurrently, um, and the result is just really chaotic. And uh, if you think about the way that um, collaboration works, I mean, we have this kind of real-time collaboration in Google Docs, which is super convenient when that's what you want. But I think people don't always actually want uh, real-time collaboration. There are also other modes of collaboration that people use. If you think about the way that you probably collaborate on code, maybe via GitHub, uh, that probably does not use real-time collaboration most of the time. Probably what you do is you edit the code on your local machine until you have it working. And then the, your code changes plus the changes to tests plus whatever, they all get bundled together into one commit. And you make a pull request on Git, uh, on GitHub, and then that allows the other people to review the code in, in a well-defined state. And so, um, you know, we have, for Google Docs, we have real-time collaboration and we have sort of changed suggestions, which is, it's not quite a pull request, really. Um, for code, we have sort of pull request and asynchronous collaboration. Um, and what I feel like it would be really valuable is to also have that sort of style of branching and merging and pull request asynchronous collaboration inside a text editor as well. Why do we not have that? I'm not sure. So some colleagues um, built a experimental collaborative text editor called Upwelling. Uh, you can find the details in this online article. And I'll show you a little video of, um, of Upwelling in action. It's uh, the idea here is essentially, can we have a collaborative text editor which supports real-time collaboration, but also which incorporates some of the best ideas from Git uh, into essentially having version control-like ideas built into a rich text editor. Uh, so here's a little, um, a little video of Upwelling. Uh, you can see it's the, exactly the same text as I just showed you in Google Docs. And by default, when I open this file, it's actually read-only and I can't change it. But if I want to edit it, I have to uh, press the button to create a new draft. Uh, and I give that a title. And think of a draft as being something quite like a branch in Git. And so now I'm in a draft. Now I can edit the document in whatever way I like. Um, but notice that it's not doing the kind of strike out highlighting like it did in the Google Docs suggestion mode. It's all very zen. I can just see the current state of the document. Um, however, once I've made these edits, then I can click the button to show changes. And now it will highlight the changes that I've just made in this draft. So moreover, what we can also do besides um, seeing the changes from, whoops, sorry, um, besides seeing the changes from, from one user here, is I can also open this drop down at the top. And we can see that there's another draft from another user. And this other user has been writing in a separate draft. Changes that you make in one draft don't appear in the other. So they're, they're like branches in Git. Changes you make on one branch don't appear on another branch until you merge them sometime later. And so this now allows uh, me to switch back and forth between different versions. And you can see on this draft, I've got uh, the new section at the bottom. In the other draft, I've got the copy edit of the introduction session. Uh, and I can turn on and off the, the show changes mode. Moreover, I can also merge a draft into the mainline uh, history of the document. And that's what I've just done with uh, the second section here. So now the addition of this um, upwelling section has now been merged into the mainline of the document. And now if I look at the draft in which the, there was the copy edit of the introduction, you can see that that upwelling section appears in there. So what has happened here is Upwelling has automatically rebased the draft on top of the merged uh, change to the mainline document. And now I can use this drop down in the top right to see the editing history of the document over all of the drafts that, are, that were merged uh, over time. So I can go back and at any point in time see exactly what changes were merged into the document at what point. 
It also supports the kind of inline commenting in the sidebar, like, like you know, from Google Docs. Um, but the main idea is really to have this, this flow of making new drafts and then merging them explicitly, which is very much like a sort of pull request um, flow uh, that you find in, in GitHub. So this is, you know, this is just experimental software, but hopefully it's, it's kind of interesting. And in the rest of this talk, I want to talk a bit about the technologies that make uh, this kind of uh, prototype here possible. So uh, another interesting thing about Upwelling is that it's an example of local first software. So local first is a, a term that some colleagues and I coined a few years ago. You can find the article here online as an introduction to the idea. And the idea here is that all of the data is stored locally on the user's own device. And so in this case, it's a, a browser-based app, so it's local storage in the web browser, but it could also be a native app using a local file system, for example. And uh, storing all the data locally is really important because it means the app works offline. So if the user does not have an internet connection right now, Upwelling still works. So you can still edit documents, you can still create drafts, you can still um, you can still go back through the editing history and see exactly who changed what when. So in that sense, it's also like Git. Uh, you know, with Git, you typically have a clone of a repository on your local machine, and you can inspect all of the, the commit history locally without needing an internet connection. And the same is true of of Upwelling as well. Now, being able to edit a document offline means there has to be some way of capturing the changes that you made and storing them so that then later when you come back online, we can resync those changes with, with any other collaborators that you have. So that means we already fundamentally need some way of tracking changes in order to do the synchronization. Um, and our insight here is that, well, if we're already tracking changes to do the synchronization, why not also use exactly that same change tracking mechanism to also enable version control like use cases so that we can have, for example, uh, branching workflows with merging, but also we can have things like diffing. So we can look at what was the document state at some point in the past and figure out exactly how the document changed from one version to another. Um, and all of this works locally by being local first software. Now, the way this is implemented is that Upwelling is based on a CRDT library called AutoMerge, uh, which you can also find online. It's all open source. And uh, I will talk a little bit about the algorithms that AutoMerge uh, uses in order to enable these kind of version control-like use cases on text. At the core of AutoMerge is a CRDT algorithm for text. Uh, the particular algorithm it uses is called RGA. Um, I won't go into too much detail on that, but the basic idea of that algorithm is that we look at the sequence of characters in a text document as essentially a list of individual characters that can be modified by inserting and deleting characters at any position in the list. And the way that the algorithm enables that is by giving a unique ID to every single character in the text document. Now, this might sound ridiculously inefficient, and it would be very inefficient if you simply attached a UUID to every single character. Um, but actually, AutoMerge uses some clever data compression techniques in order to make it quite feasible and quite efficient to have all of those unique IDs. So I will show you later how that compression works. Let me first show you at a conceptual level um, how AutoMerge tracks changes. So in this example here, we have a text document containing the characters H-E-L-O. And uh, the H has an ID of 0A, the E has an ID of 1A, and so on, up to 3A. So the IDs here consist of an integer and a letter. Uh, the, the rules for generating IDs is when you make a new ID, the integer part has to be one greater than the exi highest existing uh, integer in the document. Um, and for the letter, that is going to be the ID of the user or the node or the actor that generated that particular uh, operation. And so in this case, uh, let's say that we have node A on the left or actor A on the left, actor B on the right, and, um, and the, the first four characters were all inserted by actor A on the left. And so they have ID 0A, 1A, up to 3A respectively. Now let's say that uh, uh, actor A on the left wants to insert a second letter L after the first letter L, and the actor on the right wants to insert an exclamation mark at the end. And so these get new IDs. Uh, so the IDs 
both start with a four because they're, that's one greater than the greatest existing ID in the document, which is three. Uh, one, the ID is four A on the left because it's generated by node A and four B on the right because it's generated by node B. Now, uh, we need to somehow propagate these uh, operations over the network to the other user so that they can then merge their states. And the way that works in this algorithm is that we say we make an insertion operation uh, saying we want to insert letter L with the new ID of 4A after the existing character with ID 2A. So the first letter L is the 2A. And likewise, uh, we want to insert the exclamation mark after the existing character with ID 3A, uh, which is the letter O. And so these operations we can then just propagate to the other side and they can respectively insert the character at the appropriate point in the document. Uh, and then they will end up with the same merged state. So, you know, so far this, this seems fine, um, but the real problem here is we have all of these unique IDs on all of the characters. And so how do we make that efficient? And so the way that uh, AutoMerge does that is you can think of the changes that you make to a document over time as a kind of log of changes. So every time you type a keystroke that generates uh, a little byte string, which you can uh, send over the network to any of the users in a real-time collaboration session. And you can also store on disk. You can just append it to a file. Um, but you generate one of these little updates for every single keystroke. And even if it's just 100 bytes per keystroke, that quickly adds up to be quite a lot as we have lots of small keystrokes. And so from time to time, what we want to do is take this log of keystrokes that we've accumulated and compact it down into a small snapshot. And then that snapshot we want to still have containing the editing history, because remember, we want to do version control like things. We want to see what the, did, did the document look like yesterday, but uh, we also want to represent it in a compact way. So we do some compression into a snapshot and then later on further edits happen and they build on top of the snapshot. And then as the log gets too long again, we then just compact it down again and just do that periodic compaction process. Now, let me show you an example uh, of a particular document where we've applied this. This is a benchmark that we've been using uh, to test AutoMerge for quite a while now. And some other CRDT libraries have also adopted the same document as a benchmark. Um, this document is actually the editing trace of the LaTeX source of a research paper that a colleague and I wrote some years ago. Uh, we wrote this paper using a custom text editor that recorded every single keystroke of the process of writing this paper. Um, and so we can now replay that editing history in order to just have an example of a, a document to study. And so this editing history contains about 250,000 operations, of which it's about 180,000 uh, insertions of individual characters and about 80,000 deletions of individual characters. So that means the current, the final state of the document is about 100 kilobytes of ASCII text, um, which is all the inserted characters minus the deleted characters. Now, what do you think, what is the size of this document uh, if we store all of the CRDT metadata and all of the editing history, but store it in the most compact way we can find and compress it using whatever compression techniques we can think of? Well, the answer is we can fit the whole thing in 184 kilobytes. So this is less than twice the size of the final, um, final ASCII document. And this file now contains the full editing history, every single insertion and deletion operation that was made in the editing history of this document. Uh, it contains the unique IDs of every single character, and it also contains a timestamp of every operation so we can actually tell when which thing happened. And so based on this small 180 kilobyte file, we actually have captured the full editing history. Think of it like, like a Git clone. It's a full copy of everything you need in order to visualize the editing history of this document, um, which allows you to see back at any past version in time. So this is quite cool, I think, um, being able to represent the data in such a compact way. So let me tell you a little bit about how uh, AutoMode does that compression. As the example here, I'm going to use uh, a text document in which let's say that uh, the actor A initially types the text hi, H-I, and then actor B deletes the I and actor B types E-L-L-O so that then the text reads hello. And so I'm just going to use this as, as our 
editing trace as an, and show you how we can compress this editing trace. Now, the way AutoMerge represents this uh, information internally is using a kind of tabular form. So you can think of all of the all of the editing history of the document in one big table, and this table contains one row for every character that was inserted into the document. Uh, when a character is deleted from the document, we don't delete the corresponding row, but instead we have a column in which we can note the ID of the deletion operation. And so we essentially just mark it as deleted, but the character remains in there nevertheless. So for each character, we have the ID of that character, that is the ID of the insertion operation that created that character. We have the ID of the predecessor character, which, as I explained earlier, is needed to identify where the character should go in the document. And we have the actual character itself that was inserted. So now the internal representation of AutoMerge actually splits this table into more columns. And the uh, result looks more like this here. So the, here, the operation ID I split into two columns, one containing the integer part and the other containing the actor ID part. Then also the predecessor element ID I've split into two columns in the same way. The inserted character I've split into two columns where one column contains the actual UTF-8 byte sequence of the inserted character. And the other column contains the length in bytes of the inserted character. And then finally, for deletion, that is also split into two columns. And so now, once we have this uh, tabular layout, uh, we can think about the most efficient way of representing this and storing this table. And so the best way of storing this is actually not one row at a time, but one column at a time. This is an idea we've borrowed from uh, some large-scale database systems. So data warehouses often use this kind of technique for analytics purposes. We've applied the same technique to uh, CRDTs, and it turns out to work really well. And so the idea here is now that, let's say, we look at just the first column here. If you look at the numbers here in this column, it's one, two, four, five, six. Um, and you can imagine that as text is typed sequentially, where user tends to put one character after another in a sort of sequential order, um, the rule for the generating the integer part of these operations is that it's always one greater than the previous one. And so you tend to get these incrementing sequences of numbers. And it's not always incrementing, because at some point, the user will move their character, their, their cursor to a different position, or maybe hit backspace or do something else, which generates a discontinuity in this, uh, in this number sequence. But nevertheless, just the typical typing pattern of documents still tends to give you these uh, incrementing runs of characters. And so the way we can compress this is take one, two, four, five, six, seven, and first of all, just calculate the difference between each number and the previous number. So that turns it into one, one, two, one, one, one. And now we have lots of ones, so we can run length and code them so that all of the repetitions of the number one get represented in a very compact way. And that's enough to represent that first column. What about the second column? Well, for the second column, that tends to also contain repeated occurrences of the same value. In this case, it's actor IDs. So the actor IDs are themselves actually UIDs, so 16 bytes of randomness. But we can make a lookup table that maps each of these UIDs to a small integer. Um, so, for example, mapping A to 0 and B to 1. And now we've just got uh, a column containing zeros and ones repeated, so we can run length and code that. Again, the result is very efficient. What about the actual inserted character? Well, I said we can store the UTF-8 byte sequence in one column and the length in another column. The length for the length column, if it's English text, then it'll typically be one byte because it's just ASCII, uh, one byte for each character. Of course, there might be an emoji somewhere in the middle, which might be longer than that. But on the whole, the majority of characters will probably be one byte long. If it's Chinese text, then it'll be three bytes per character, whatever. Depending on what language you're in, uh, the length per character might be different. But you will still tend to get repeated occurrences of the same length number uh, in the column. And so that, again, compresses very nicely. And now once we've stored the length of each character in one column, now, the actual UTF-8 byte content, we can just concatenate those because we have the separate column that would allow us to split it out into individual characters, again, if we need to. And so here, the compressed representation of this column is just take all of the letters that appear in this, which is now high-low, um, which doesn't make sense by itself, but allows us to 
figure out exactly what the character was of, of each insertion in there. Uh, and then moreover, uh, AutoMerge actually applies a um, just a gzip deflate compression on top of that uh, in order to compress the text further. And uh, this worked really well. And that is the basis of the compression that I just explained to you. It's very effective at uh, compressing text edits. And moreover, it allows us to not just um, you know, store the editing history efficiently, but actually it allows us to figure out what the document was at arbitrary points in time and also do that efficiently. And so in order to do that, let me show you how we might represent a particular point in time in the editing history. So let's say we want to see what was the document at this point uh, here where the red arrow points to. And so we can represent this point in time in the editing history as think of it kind of like a vector clock. So what we have here is a mapping from node IDs to integers where the integer is the integer part of the highest operation that had already happened from that actor at that point in time. And so here, this particular point where the arrow points to, uh, at that point, actor A had done two operations, actor B had not yet done any operations, and therefore we have A to B zero. But if we wanted to point at the latest version of the document, that might have a vector clock of A to B seven, because by that point, B has, uh, has executed operations up to ID 7B. And now we have these vector clocks, we can apply those to our table. So we can look at each individual character in this table and figure out, was this character visible as of a particular version of the document? So for example, this uh, insertion of the letter H, well, the insertion operation has an ID of 1A. 1A is contained within that vector clock. So therefore the insertion had already happened at the point in time when uh, that, that we're looking at. Uh, and moreover, that character has not been deleted, and so that character H must be visible in that document version. What about the character I? Well, the character I has an insertion ID of 2A, which is also contained in the vector clock A to B0, because we're assuming we're doing a less than or equal comparison here. So 2A is still contained within there, which means that the insertion of that character had already happened at that point in time. The deletion of that character, well, the deletion has an operation ID of 3B. 3B is not contained within B0. And so therefore, the deletion of this character had not yet happened as of this point in time. So therefore, the character has been inserted, but not yet been deleted. Therefore, the character I is visible at this point in time. What about the letter E? Well, the letter E has an insertion operation of 4B, which is not contained in the vector clock A2. Uh, B0, and so therefore this character had not yet been inserted at that point in time, and therefore that character is not visible. And so we can go one by one over the characters in the table, and for each character we can determine very efficiently whether it was visible or not uh, at a particular point in the editing history. And so this then allows us to reconstruct, just concatenate all of the visible characters, that gives us hi, and so now we know what the document was at this point in time. We can also very efficiently determine how the document changed from one version to another because we can repeat the same visibility calculation for a different vector clock to get the visibility at a bit different point in time. And in this later point in time here, the letter I has been deleted, but the letters E, L, L, O have been inserted. And this gives us a diff now. So this allows us to determine if a character was formerly visible and is now invisible, that means it was deleted. If a character was previously invisible and is now visible, that means it was inserted. And this, uh, and this just doing a single scan over the table allows us to efficiently determine the visibility and the visibility changes. And that forms the basis of these diffuse in upwelling, because now it's very efficient and easy to figure out exactly what changed from one document version to another. And moreover, it's also easy to determine who made which change, which of the users made which change, and so we can highlight them in different colors, and uh, you know we get a nice diff view like this. So that is the core of how uh, AutoMerge does plain text, uh, plain text collaboration, supporting these kind of version control ideas. But I thought I would also talk a little bit about rich text. So you can see in Upwelling here, there is rich text in here. So there's a little bit of bold text somewhere. There's some headings. It supports italic and other so formatting as well. And uh, so actually, we also need to include that formatting information somehow, right? So we need to be able to propose changes to formatting along with changes to text. 
And we also need to be able to diff the formatting and we need to tell what was the formatting of the document at some particular point in the past. And so in order to enable that, we also developed a new algorithm. This algorithm is called Peritext and you can find it uh, online in described in this article here. And I will just briefly give you an idea of some of the different ways we considered representing rich text uh, as a CRDT before we actually ended up deciding on how to do peritext. And so it turns out that there are several different ways how you might represent rich text that actually have some serious problems when you try to merge concurrent edits. And so the first way of representing rich text that you might think of is to represent it as a tree, uh, because you know in your web browser, the DOM representation of uh, HTML uses a tree data structure like this. And the idea is that in this case, for example, you've got both users with a paragraph node. And if they want to mark some word as bold or italic, you would create a new bold or italic element uh, in this tree. And you would put the bold or italic text inside that element and delete that text from the surrounding paragraph. And so in this case, let's say that we have the initial text, uh, the fox jumped, and the user A on the top wants to make the word jumped bold, and the user B on the bottom wants to make the same word italic. And now if you use a uh, tree CRDT uh, to represent this kind of rich text, unfortunately what you get as the merge result is that the word jumped becomes duplicated because we've inserted two separate tree nodes in this, one bold node and one italic node. And the algorithm doesn't know that these bold and italic nodes are actually meant to be, meant to apply to the same text. So it just treats it as two separate uh, tree node insertions. And as a result, now the text re reads the fox jumped, jumped. And so that's not really great. Okay, so representing the state as a text doesn't seem to work that well. What are the alternatives? Well. We tried another alternative, which is to represent rich text as marker. So that just means we have some sort of markers that tell us when does bold begin, when does bold end. Now, this turns, to, turns out to also not work very well. Let's take this example here where the fox jumped is bold and then over the dog is not bold. And let's say the user A on the top wants to unbold everything. And the way you would remove the bold formatting in this case is just to delete the start and end bold markers from the text. Concurrently, user B at the bottom wants to unbold only the word fox, but leave the and jumped being bold. And so the way you would have to do this is by inserting an end bold before fox and a start bold after fox, and then everything turns out all right. But what happens when we merge these now? Well, the outer two, the original two markers have been deleted by user A. Two new end bold and bold markers have been inserted by user B. Now, first of all, we have an end bold before a start bold, so that's already weird, but okay, we could just like uh, paper over that. The weirder thing here is that now the start bold here now applies to all of the text following the start bold marker, which means we've turned the entire rest of the document bold. So the words over the dog, which were previously not bold and none of the users wanted to make them bold, but suddenly, as a result of this merge, those words have become bold now, and potentially the entire rest of the document has become bold. And that's not really great either, so we didn't really want to use this representation either. Let's try a third approach. We could try representing formatting as just like a single bit on every character. So let's say a bold bit on each character, an italic bit on each character, and then just you know apply it individually to every character in the sequence. And yes, we could do that, but it also has some weird effects. So, for example, we want to support not just bold and italic, but also inline comments, like I showed you earlier in the video. And so, for example, maybe one user wants to attach the comment which fox to the words the and fox. And concurrently, another user wants to insert the word brown in between the and fox. Now, the word brown, the characters in the word brown did not have a comment to attach, attach to them when they were inserted. And as a result, when we merge these edits, now we get a weird gap in the comment. So the comment used to be a contiguous sequence of characters, and now it's got a gap in the middle, which has no comment. And again, we could say like, okay, if this happens, we somehow close the gap, but it's also messy and it didn't really feel like the right way of doing things. Um, so what we ended up with, with Peritext, is an algorithm that works like this. It uh, relies on the fact that we have a unique ID for every character anyway from the underlying text CRDT, 
which means we can actually store the text just as text, just as plain text, and store all of the formatting information externally attached to the text on the outside. And the way we do that is, for example, if you want to make a span of text bold, we generate a bold operation that says from this character ID up to that character ID, everything within that span should be bold. And we attach a timestamp to this operation. So with timestamp T1, this is telling us um, that bold formatting occurred at that particular point in time. And now, for example, user A on the top maybe wants to unbold part of the sequence. And so we don't remove the bold operation. We create a new operation with a timestamp T2 that says from this up, uh, character ID up to that character ID is now unbold. And because T2 has a higher timestamp than T1, we know that the unbolding has priority over the bolding. And so therefore, the characters in that span should not be bold as the final result. But concurrently, maybe uh, the user B on the bottom uh, wants to make italic the third word, and so generates a timestamp T3 uh, with an italic operation. And the nice thing is these operations all merge together really nicely now. And so we've simply captured the history of formatting change operations to the document. Um, and using timestamps, we can tell which one is newer, which one is older. And having this information now not only allows us to merge those uh, edits together in a nice way, but also it forms the basis of these version control use cases, because of course we need to also figure out what was the formatting of the document at some past point in time. And again, using these timestamps allows us to do that. Right, so the way how all of this is implemented is AutoMerge is a Rust library. Um, and the reason for using Rust is that it's so nicely portable across lots of different platforms. So you can use it from Rust if you want, but we also compile it to WebAssembly and thus have uh, make it accessible to JavaScript and TypeScript browser-based operations, uh, applications, sorry. Um, but we also have a C API, so you can use it from Go, for example, and there are bindings for Swift and for Java slash Android uh, in order to make mobile apps. And the idea is that really you can write apps across any of these platforms and they will all be able to interoperate because they use the same data format and the same conflict resolution algorithms. Um, AutoMerge itself is just a data structure library. It's just manages in-memory data. So for storing data on disk and also for sending data over the network, there's a separate IO lab library called AutoMerge repo, which handles storage and networking. And so for example, if it's a local, uh, if it's a native app, you could write data to the local file system. But if it's a browser based app, you might write the data to IndexedDB. And then you can use whatever networking stack happens to be available on your platform. Uh, for example, WebSocket or peer to peer over WebRTC or whatever else you like, plain TCP works as well. And so AutoMerge started out as a research project quite a few years ago. Um, and for a while, it was just essentially me hacking on some JavaScript. But uh, over the years, the project has become a lot more mature. And so in particular, about uh, two years ago, we developed this new compressed data format and released that. And uh, that is really the basis of being able to do any of these um, version control like things efficiently. And uh, more recently, then, we moved the project from JavaScript to Rust. And uh, thanks to some industrial sponsors, we're now able to actually have production support for companies that are building software in production based on AutoMerge. Um, and we've got uh, one software engineer working full time. His name is Alex Good, and he is indeed very good. And uh, he's been working, thanks to our industrial sponsors, on just making this uh, research code actually production quality stuff. And uh, the project has become so much better since he's been working on it. So that's sort of the brief summary of uh, where AutoMerge has come from and where it's going. And so the rich text features that I just explained to you with Paratex is just making its way into AutoMerge mainline uh, release right now. Uh, the performance has got a lot better and so on. So huge amount I could still tell you, but I'm afraid I'm out of time. So I think I will leave it at that. Uh, here are the various articles that I referenced. Um, so you can read up more on any of these ideas here. And uh, in terms of q and I'm, I'm afraid I can't see the room or can't hear the room. So what we'll do is just leave that on Slack. Uh, I'm on the, uh, on the Strange Loop Slack. So you can find me there. And if you want to ask me anything, uh, you can find me there. Also, several of my colleagues who work 
on auto merge and upwelling and these related projects are at strange loop and hopefully you can catch them there so i will leave it at that uh, thank you very much for coming along and uh, enjoy the rest of strange loop